Hello, I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Welcome to Conversations with History. Our guest today is Dr. Jennifer Doudna, who is professor in the Department of Chemistry and the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at UC Berkeley, and Lee K. Shing, Chancellor's Professor in Biomedical and Health Research. She is also the director of the Innovative Genomics Institute at Berkeley. Jennifer, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. What led you to go into science as a career? I grew up on a small island in the middle of the Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, the island of Hawaii. And it was there that I think I really gained my uh, desire to study the chemistry of life. I was fascinated by the evolutionary process that led to all of the diverse animals and plants that we see in that environment. And I wanted to understand how they got there. And, and uh, your, neither of your parents were scientists. No, no, my parents were academics, but they were in the humanities. My dad was an American literature professor at the university in Hawaii, and my mom was a history lecturer. And uh, your father, at some point early in your life, gave you uh, a copy of The Double Helix. He did, yeah, I was probably 12 years old. My God, and you read it. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a secret reveal. <laughs> so, so what, what, uh, what led you uh, to want to focus on biochemistry and the structure, uh, biological structures? I got very excited about chemistry in high school. I had a wonderful chemistry teacher, Miss Wong, who uh, showed us kids that science was about the process of discovery. And I somehow got fascinated with the idea that you could understand the details of molecules in living systems. And that's what I wanted to do for my career. And uh, the, the, uh, you were educated, your, graduate, your undergraduate work was at Pomona. Pomona, yeah. And uh, where did you do your uh, doctorate? So from Pomona, I went to Boston. I went and worked at Harvard Medical School, where I was in the Department of uh, Biological Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology, a big mouthful. But it was a wonderful place that had a lot of classical biochemists, as well as people thinking about uh, the chemistry of life in biomedical settings. Uh, and I, I read it in your book uh, that at some point you, looking back at your own life, you saw that the common thread was correcting defective genes? Is that a fair statement, restatement? Not, not exactly. I think the common thread always for me has been uh, understanding the evolution of, of the, you know, the sort of the fundamental molecules that we see in modern biology. And that's a big, you know, big topic, obviously. But for me, it was always about thinking about life's origins and what can we learn about the history of life on our planet from studying how things work today. And, you know, I've always been fascinated by the flow of genetic information, again, kind of stemming from the, you know, the story described in the double helix, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, who did you work under uh, at the Harvard Medical School? That, that's really kind of the first step uh, in the trajectory of your uh, uh, education toward uh, the discovery you were to make? Yeah. Well, I worked with three scientists in the first year I was there, as, as typically happens in graduate programs like that. We had rotations that we did as students, so we were you know, working in several different labs to get a flavor of different kinds of science. So I worked in uh, first for a professor named Roberto Coulter, who studies how bacteria produce toxins that poison other bacteria in their environment. So that was a fascinating sort of introduction to the biology of what's happening in, out in sort of in the environment. Second, I worked with a guy named Richard Kolodner, uh, very well known for his work on DNA repair. And actually, interestingly, that uh, came back to me later in my later work. And third was uh, Jack Shostak, who I, whose lab I actually ended up joining and worked under for my PhD, who also, at that time, was studying the process of DNA repair. But in his lab, I actually took on a new project to understand how RNA molecules might have played a role in the origin of life. 
And so this is where the origin of your focus on RNA? Yes. And was that a hot topic at the time? Was that uh, initially it was thought that RNA didn't do much, right? Is that that it was primarily a messenger? Is that a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement. Uh, certainly when I was going through school, um, RNA seemed like the least interesting of the major macromolecules in living systems, um, proteins were exciting because they do a lot of interesting things in the cell. DNA, of course, is the important repository of genetic information and responsible for passing it on to future generations. And then RNA was, you know, we were sort of taught that it was a, an intermediary and a messenger and maybe not uh, a molecule playing an active role in biology. And what was happening when I was in grad school, and my advisor, Jack Shostak, was a big um, you know, player in this was the fundamental change in thinking across, uh, you know, biological scientists that, in fact, RNA molecules do a lot of very active and important things in cells, and they can also g give us hints about how life might came might have come to be. And so, your focus initially was on biochemistry, uh, and. Uh, uh, what sorts of things did you look at beyond what your mentors were doing? Well, in my graduate work, I was studying how RNA molecules might be capable of self-replication. In other words, making copies of themselves, something that we think is a fundamental definition of life, is uh, you know, having an, uh, organisms are able to replicate, they're able to divide and make more of themselves. And so I was investigating that at a molecular level by studying RNA molecules that have some of those properties that we can, you know, investigate in the laboratory. But beyond that, I, you know, I think I really learned from my graduate advisor, uh, Dr. Shostak, that uh, science is, you know, he, he was so passionate about his work and he was a very big thinker. He was always, you know, I'd go into his office in the afternoon and he'd be reading uh, journal articles about, uh, you know, applied mathematics, you know, things like that. So the thing's very far afield from what we were researching in the laboratory, but he had so many interests and that, that, that was really infectious to see such a wise person who was working on very detailed problems in his research lab, but had such broad-based interests. So this raises uh, an important point about science. A lot of it is interdisciplinary. It is, yeah. And, and uh, you learn from each other's and not just the others in your particular. Absolutely, in, in yeah. Your, and I read somewhere that you learn from him how to identify the problem and, and focus on it and how, therefore, to frame the right questions. Well, I admired that greatly about him, I have to say. When I, this was something I observed when I was a student in his lab, and I couldn't imagine how he did it. But somehow, he seemed to always be asking the right question, you know, and he, he could frame these very big questions like, how did life evolve on Earth? That sounds like a huge problem. How would you ever investigate it in the lab? But he had the ability to frame that question in a way that you could actually break it down as an, a studyable you know, problem that you could investigate with experiments. And I, I thought that was an incredible skill that he had. And uh, d does one learn to do that from a mentor or do you self-teach yourself as you go along? I think it's it's a combination. You know, I think uh, when I was a student in, in, in Shostak's lab, of course, I learned a lot from, from him and watching him in action and also directly, um, you know, through his mentorship. But frankly, he had a, he put together a lab of brilliant uh, people who were colleagues of mine. And every day in the laboratory, we would be talking about experiments and about, you know, questions that we were investigating, papers we were reading, things we just wondered about. And so it was a really exciting sort of intellectual melting pot of people from different backgrounds who were interested in similar questions. And th this is a theme that recurs again and again, sort of groups of scientists and of students actually interacting on a regular basis and, and each sharing where they were going. Right. Right, and I think that's a theme that I've always, you know, enjoyed in science. It's not, you know, honestly, it's not something I imagined would be a part of my professional life as a scientist back when I was first being trained, because I imagined, you know, sort of the uh, 
uh, the media uh, presentation of scientists as being um, people in white lab coats with black room glasses and you know very geeky and working maybe in isolation. And I, I discovered in graduate school that it's very science is a very different process than that. It's actually all about people. Uh, you then went to Colorado mm -hmm. to fill in your your knowledge about the world you wanted to explore. What is it you wanted to do there? Study the, the how the structure of RNA? Exactly. So when I was in graduate school, and as I was wrapping up my, my research there, I realized that to really understand how these RNA molecules I was studying operated in a biological setting, we really had to understand their three-dimensional shapes because that would explain the kind of chemistry and chemical reactions that they could be involved in. And so at the time, there was only one type of RNA structure, molecular structure that was known. And in fact, uh, nobody had really seriously investigated RNA structures for you know about 10 or 12 years at that point. And um, I decided that I needed to, I wanted to go after that as a as a, a next direction in my work. And to do so, I decided I would pick the very best RNA biochemist that I could find, and that was Tom Check, who was a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. So what's interesting here is it's you're on a path uh, of understanding uh, RNA in its many dimensions, but you're, you, you encounter problems plus curiosity which define the next step. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so as a result of your work in Colorado, you were then positioned to think uh, about the structure of RNA and how it interacted with the biochemistry. Is that a fair way to state that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's very fair, yeah. yeah. Yeah, looking at, I mean, it's sort of like, uh, you know, thinking about um, form, follow, you know, sort of um, establishing function. And we think about this in, it's a principle in architecture, for example, mm -hmm. right? Well, it's very similar all the way down at the molecular level that, you know, form basically establishes function and you can, uh, form follows function. And so um, by understanding the shapes of molecules and how they're put together, you can understand a lot about their functions and purpose in biological settings. So you go back to Yale, or you're at Yale now after Colorado, continuing this work, but then you come to Berkeley. Yeah. Yep. So I got hired. My first job was at Yale. I got hired there as a professor in 1994. I was, you know, stunned that they would uh, hire hire me, but they did, and um, and it was a remarkable uh, experience to go to the molecular biophysics and biochemistry department at Yale, where some of the most eminent people in the country work, and really probably in the world, you know, working on uh, molecular structures and, and and properties of molecules in some of the most fundamental pathways in biology were researching their, doing their work at the time. And, uh, but then, uh, you know, eight years later, I made the very kind of bittersweet decision at the time to move to UC Berkeley. And why did I do that? Well, I, you know, I was uh, offered a position at Berkeley. And um, although I had been extremely happy at Yale and very well supported there, I could also see exciting opportunities that would be special to Berkeley. For example, being embedded in a much larger university system adjacent to a national laboratory right across the bay from an outstanding uh, medical school and Stanford right down the street. It just seemed like a wonderful intellectual environment in the Bay Area. And it didn't hurt that, you know, it's a pretty nice place to live. Yeah, that's right. And to raise a family. And to raise a family. Right. right. So, so you're, you're working here now. You're, you've established your credentials in RNA, and then one day you get a call from professor uh, in another department, I believe, and uh, what does she tell you, and how, how does that lead on a trail to your discovery? Well, I was, uh, when I moved the lab to Berkeley, we started studying something that I had not worked on uh, at, up until that, that point, uh, which was how very small pieces of RNA in mammalian cells, even human cells, are able to control 
how and when certain proteins are, are made. And we were fascinated by that process, how had it evolved and how did it work, and we were studying the molecules involved in that pathway, with, which is called RNA interference, or RNAi. And, uh, and, the, uh, and then I was uh, you know, sitting innocently in my mm -hmm. office one day at Berkeley, and um, Jillian Banfield, a professor here in Earth and Planetary Science, co contacted me, and she said that uh, she had seen my work on RNA interference, and she wanted to meet because she had an interesting observation in her work about the possibility that bacteria were also using an RNA interference kind of mechanism, but with entirely different molecular machinery. And of course, I was fascinated. And she Googled you. She did. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and so, and, and it was clear that your background and what you were working on uh, uh, related. So this, this, together with a meeting you had with your uh, co-discoverer, uh, on a walk at a conference in San Juan. Right. Uh, and she was essentially working on the same problem, Emmanuel Charpentier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Emmanuel Charpentier. So, and this is another great instance of how, you know, s there's interesting serendipity in, in science. So, Emmanuel Charpentier and I met for the first time at a meeting in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And we recognized that we were working on different aspects of the same bacterial pathway, a bacterial immune system known as CRISPR. And at that conference, we decided to team up to investigate a particular protein that's part of that pathway that Emmanuel's lab was starting to investigate at the time, a protein called Cas9. And uh, there was some sense in the broader community that something was going on, but no one with Cas9, but no one had yet figured out uh, exactly what it did and how it did it. Right. Okay. And so the discovery that was revolutionary by you and your collaborator and, and your teams was what? Well, it was fundamentally figuring out how this protein Cas9 uses a, an RNA molecule to identify a segment of DNA and cut it, right? So it's just, you can imagine it like, you know, DNA is sort of like a ropey molecule in the cell. You've got this very, very, very long rope that encodes all of the genetic information necessary for the cell to function. And what Cas9 does is to find a place in that rope, which is put together by letters of the DNA code, so it's a you know programmable uh, you know kind of code, and what Cas9 does with its RNA guide is to find a place in that coded sequence and make a break. And why was this so 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 exciting? Well, you know, first of all, we had set out to figure out you know how does sort of a somewhat modest question: How does this protein function as part of a bacterial immune system. And what our work revealed was that in bacteria, this protein is programmed with molecules of RNA that give it the information to find and cut virus DNA. Mm -hmm. So it's a way that bacteria can destroy virus the, uh, particles that might try to infect the cell. But in the course of doing that fundamental research and answering that question of how it works, we realized that it could be harnessed for a different purpose because of its ability to easily find and cut any sequence of DNA. And because we knew how it worked, we could reprogram it in the laboratory to, for example, uh, cut a gene that uh, leads to cystic fibrosis development and trigger cells to make a change in the DNA sequence at precisely that place that could correct a disease-causing mutation like that. So, in effect, your teams were uh, identifying the scissors, so to speak, and then also the GPS system, yes. which is the tracer RNA, if I have this right, right, which together make this revolution possible in understanding uh, how the place in the DNA is found, how it's cut, and it's replaced with something else. And yeah. what 
when Bainfield called you, she was saying, well, we're looking at this DNA and there are these strips, pieces of RNA in the DNA. What is this? You know, we don't understand. And you were the one who was positioned in a way because of the work we just discussed to begin the analysis of that. Well, just a, a little, um, a little um, uh, revision there to what you just said. So what Banfield had found was that there's no RNA directly in the DNA, mm. but, but the important thing that she identified was that there was evidence from her research that bacteria had a programmable system, so they had this GPS as you're mm -hmm. alluding to. And the question was, how does it work? She suspected that it might be an RNA-based system, which was the reason she Googled me and contacted me. And that's exactly what we figured out, was that it's an RNA-guided system that can be reprogrammed easily once you understand how to program it. You can do that in the laboratory. It can be introduced into different kinds of cells where it then functions as a tool that scientists can use to reprogram the DNA in cells. And, and you team figured out a way to combine these two functions in one unit, is that? Yes, so yeah. yes, and this is kind of getting a little bit into the weeds about how it works, but it's actually important. So it turns out that in nature, there are two separate molecules of RNA necessary to create the GPS, right, that do the actual programming of the Cas9 protein. And our team figured out how you could combine them into one single piece of RNA that could be easily reprogrammed by scientists anywhere to target DNA sequences in animals, plants, fungi, basically any kind of cell. And so briefly, the, the revolution here is what this discovery means is that it can be applied across the board in, in all sorts of living things and domains. So uh, biomedicine, uh, agriculture, uh, where uh, changes that are very precise can be made in the DNA to create a positive revolution, but also possibly a negative one. Exactly, yeah. So it's a very powerful technology that is widely you know, applicable across biology, as you, as you just described, and importantly, it, it became very quickly adopted by labs globally. And the reason was that it was easy, it was easy mm. to use. We found that you know, we could um, have students come to the laboratory over the summertime and within a few weeks we had them using Cas9 to edit human cells. Imagine, it was just sort of you know, incredible opening the door of opportunity for scientists. And I think what's happened over the last six years is that you know, we've seen increasing applications of this technology, as you said, and you know, for biomedical purposes, in agriculture, in what we call synthetic biology. And so there's been a tremendous uh, increase in the pace of science and just the number of publications that are coming out in the scientific literature because of this tool that's so enabling. Now, importantly, uh, as we've looked at your career and the problems you were interested in, you weren't going for this result. You were uh, following a path of pure research. Uh, your curiosity was leading you to the next problem. Right. And then, wow, you came upon uh, this uh, uh, insight that had all sorts of revolutionary implications. Now, let's, let's move to the whole... Uh, realization, which then you, you turn into something of a, of a public advocate to uh, help the, the, all sorts of constituencies understand the implications of this, uh, because it has policy implications, has ethical uh, implications, it has potential national security implications. Correct, yeah. So I, uh, you know, it's been a, a profound uh, evolution for me over the last few years, recognizing that this project that, as you said, you know, began as a fundamental research project, a, you know, kind of a very focused question that we were asking in our work. But once this technology was born, it really quickly was clear that this was going to be, uh, you know, 
first of all, kind of revolutionary, and secondly, that it would have a lot of implications beyond uh, scientists working in their, uh, you know, sort of sequestered away in their laboratories. And so I had to make a decision about, you know, how I would manage that. And I have to tell you that initially I felt very uncomfortable with the idea of speaking publicly about some of these broader implications because like many scientists I felt first of all that I'm not trained professionally in bioethics and so who was I to be speaking about this and secondly that um, you know I had a lab to run and I had classes to teach and I had you know I had a, a pretty full-time job at Berkeley but um, I, I really came to see that uh, I had to to step up to the plate on this because I had been involved in the the genesis of this technology, and it, it came with a lot of responsibility. There, there's a, a sense here that this has to have a pra profound effect on the way we train students. So I in the future, uh, science students may have to think about their Im implications of the work on the one hand, although they want to go for discovery, they sure. want to fulfill their curiosity, but also students in the social science or in policy studies are gonna to have to know some of the science because we've got ethical issues here, we've got policy issues. Right, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And, and do you see that as part of your advocacy role to say, hey, let's think about our curriculums? I do, um, and maybe I should be, I'm feeling a little bit guilty when I hear you saying that, because I, uh, maybe I should be doing more of that. But uh, I, would doing enough. <laughs> <laughs> I would say at the moment, I'm probably leading more by example than anything else. I have not uh, put in place you know, particular policy or curriculum changes, for example, here at, at my university at Berkeley. Um, but uh, what I definitely do is I feel that you know a lot of the kinds of speaking engagements that I have right now are, are frankly with groups of students, often they're uh, younger students, even high school uh, students. And what I try to do in those forums is to tell students that you know my experience exemplifies what can happen in science, where you start off with uh, you know one particular goal or set of questions, and science being the kind of process that it is, it goes naturally in unexpected directions, and that we all have to be prepared for the broader implications of our work and be prepared to step out of the lab and discuss the implications, the significance of our work, and, and, and explain how that affects uh, societal decisions. And, and there's an education role here also for the general public. And I should uh, point out that uh, you have co-written a book, A Crack in Creation, where you uh, talk about the evolution of your science and of your thinking about this set of problems we're addressing. Now, let's talk a minute about some of the uh, negative consequences of this, because there's in, in genetics, there's a history of going down the wrong path. In, in the early uh, history of that discipline, going toward genetics, in the case of what you've discovered, uh, one can envision states uh, using uh, this technology with the hope of creating a super race on the one hand or eliminating populations on the other. Uh, talk a little about that. Well, it sounds pretty scary when you describe it that way. <laughs> I think the reality is that both of those scenarios right now remain in the realm of science fiction. And uh, for thankfully, for, thankfully <laughs> right for for many for many reasons, um, but uh, but what I do think is now on 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 the table, frankly, is the potential to alter individual human beings genetically, and to do that not just in a in a way that affects an individual, but in a way that affects that individual and all of their future you know, children and grandchildren. And so, in other words, it creates a heritable change to DNA. And um, that really is a profound thing when you think about it, because it means that we now have the power to, you know, control evolution, as our book, you know, discusses. And, um, and not only of uh, other uh, organisms in our environment, but of ourselves. And so that, that really makes us have to think very hard about 
first of all, whether to do that, and I think the answer will be yes, whether we want it to be or not. I think there will be people that want to use it this way. And then, you know, we have to ask uh, how and when and why would one want to do this? And I think most people would say, well, if there's a, an unmet medical need that necessitates uh, correction to DNA, you know, there might be an argument to be made that we should actually do that in people so we could remove a disease-causing mutation from maybe an entire family. And you could imagine that could be very beneficial from a health perspective. There's also, though, the potential for what we call enhancements and changes to be made to DNA that are um, maybe perceived to be desirable in some way, but don't actually impact uh, someone's health directly. So We should make an important distinction here as part of our public education role between a somatic cell and a germ cell. Yes. Do a brief. Yes, uh, and we talked about this in the Elberg yes. uh, lecture, right? But it, you, you raise a very important point, and that is that uh, when we edit, when we use uh, genome editing, this technology CRISPR-Cas9 in what we call somatic cells, that means we're making changes to cells that are uh, fully developed. They're not uh, cells that can lead to a new organism, whether it's a human being or a plant or anything else, right? So it's uh, somatic cell changes affect just an individual and not uh, not their their uh, their progeny. But if we make changes in germ cells, whether that's uh, in the form of embryos or eggs or sperm, those genetic changes can become part of an individual and be passed on to future generations. So that's a much more profound kind of editing. Well, one of the ways for, for uh, getting the world to think about how we should regulate uh, the implications of all of this is the notion of the international community of scientists. So in this recent incident where a Chinese scientist uh, did uh, work that affected the germline and seemed to not know what he was doing, uh, he presented this at an international conference, but there was really an uproar uh, from the scientific community that this was a step too far without careful thought. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think what what you're referring to is um, an announcement from uh, last November, November of 2018, by a Chinese scientist in uh, at a meeting in Hong Kong that was actually in a meeting organized. Uh, I was on the organizing committee organized to discuss human genome editing and this issue of human germline editing. And what was announced there was that, in fact, a team of scientists had uh, done this already, and not in just in a research setting, but they had actually implanted edited embryos and um, to achieve a pregnancy, and children, uh, twin girls, had been born with reported edits to the DNA. So this really, I think, shook up the international scientific community profoundly because it emerged as the details of the work were un un unveiled that um, the particular edits that were made to those two girls were, in fact, uh, changes to DNA that had never been observed in humans and had, in fact, never been tested in animals. So it really, you know, had the feeling of doing uh, research on, on people and without appropriate consent or a plan for following their health in the future. So it was really quite shocking, I would say. Uh, another constituency, it seems to me, that needs to be educated or our political leaders, mm -hmm. because they're going to have to define the rules, the legislation, the laws that, on the one hand, regulate, uh, moderate, control without interfering with the work of science and the creativity that will lead to great discoveries. Any thoughts on that, besides reading your book? <laughs> what should they do? <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, I've been actually very pleased that there's been quite a lot of interest on, on the part of various governments, including here in the United States, but also in other countries. And over the last several years, I've had um, the opportunity to visit with a number of uh, government delegations who have been on fact-finding missions, trying to understand what's happening on the research front and how they should be addressing any uh, regulatory needs that are arising due to 
new technology, including uh, genome editing. So there's attention being paid to this for sure. Um, I think the you know the devil's in the details. How do we how do we think about this? And I, it's almost a rhetorical question because, and I, if, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too because. Um, there's no easy answer, in my opinion. I, I don't think that we would want a situation where uh, non-scientists are uh, placing a large number of regulations on uh, the scientific community that might, frankly, um, imp you know, Im impair the ability to develop new ideas and, and creative work that will solve real problems and help people with their health care and other kinds of uh, situations that they're facing. I, you know, I, I feel very deeply about that. But at the same time, one does not want to see uh, technologies being utilized as we observed in this announcement from last November where people are being experimented on, uh, perhaps without their real understanding of what's happening and certainly in ways that I would consider to be unethical. It, it, it's interesting because it strikes me that uh, although the science is moving very quickly, that you all, <clears throat> excuse me, you almost have to do this on a case by case basis, and yeah. and that the the case of the the Chinese scientists, there clearly was a mobilization by the scientific, the international scientific community about the implications of this, because some of this seems to be about alerting the political leaders and alerting uh, the public about the implications. I am I think of nuclear weapons and the important role that things like Pugwash, these meetings between scientists on both sides and how it shaped the actual political negotiation uh, with regard to uh, the control of nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, the, the one caveat here is goes back to a point you made in your lecture, which is the tool we now have is a one of democratization. Yeah. Anybody can do it. Yeah, yeah. That's both a blessing and a curse. Yeah. <laughs> well, one last question. If students were to watch this and look back uh, at your career, what, what should they learn about creativity in science and the road to great discoveries? I think keeping an open mind is very important. And I also think that it's very valuable to um, follow your passions, you know, and pay attention to what each of us finds exciting. What I've learned over the years from my students, my many students uh, that have worked in the lab with me, is that, um, you know, each person that comes to the laboratory comes with their own. Uh, you know, cultural background, their own intellectual interests, their own uh, skill set. And I think for each of us, we have to discover about ourselves what kinds of questions we most want to answer in, in science. And for me, it's always been about paying attention to that, you know, kind of inner voice, things that I find really exciting and interesting, and coupling that with working with, uh, you know, people smarter than me, you know, just trying to find people that are really um, going to help build a team that can uh, ask questions and do science in a way that's both uh, intellectually stimulating and fun. And, and this path is a vehicle for building self-confidence, which I think uh, I've read you feel is very important. Very important. I often think back to a story. I, I can't remember if I told it in the book or not, but you know, I was a—I think I was a second-year graduate student, and I had joined uh, Shostak's lab at at, at Harvard. And um, uh, you know, it was very clear that I was working for somebody who was, uh, you know, kind of a creative genius in the lab. And I was so um, amazed that you know he would have accepted me into his lab. And I remember one day I was, you know, sitting at my desk and I was planning out. An experiment that I was going to do that day, and he came down the hall and he came over to me and he said, uh, "You know, hey Jennifer, I was, um, you know, I've been thinking about an idea uh, for 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 an experiment, and I wanted to bounce it off of you to see what you think and see if you think it's a good idea." And I can't tell you how stunned I was. Mm -hmm. This brilliant professor is asking for my, uh, you know, little second year grad student's opinion about his idea. And it was that kind of interaction that I had with my a number of mentors, but certainly with Shostak over the years, that I think helped me really build my confidence in the beginning. Well, on that uh, positive note, uh, uh, thank you very much, Jennifer, be, being with us and, and sharing the 
trajectory of uh, your career with us and leading to this wonderful discovery. Thank Thanks you. so much for hosting me. Yeah, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.